close enough. <laughs> My name is Rob, and I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church, and especially if you're visiting with us today, a, a welcome to you. Uh, we're glad you're here, and we hope that the Lord speaks to you today through our time together, through our worship together, and through his word, and through the things that we talk about. Um, this weekend, uh, we had a wedding here at the church, a wedding for Lachlan and Esther Johnson. And so we want to celebrate that this morning with a round of applause. And I'd love to pray a blessing upon them this morning as well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this new family, this new joining of two people. Lord, we pray, pray that you would be centered to all that they do, that you would speak to them and share with them, that they would live their lives in honor and service of you, and that they would glorify you with the decisions they make, the ways that they think, and the things that they say. Uh, Lord, we commit them to your care and to your blessing. In your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we are talking about congregationalism. Now, we're in the middle of a series kind of about some different things that Baptists hold to be true that aren't necessarily unique to Baptists, but are called Baptist distinctives. So when you bring all these distinctives kind of into one place, it usually looks like a Baptist. And so these are the things that we're talking about. There certainly are lots of other groups that practice various forms of congregationalism, and, uh, and there, it's not the only thing that defines whether you're a Baptist or not. And so there are things that... Uh, um, that that others do that that aren't Baptists that oh man I'm tripping over my words pretty hard today uh, there are th the congregationalism is something that others do as well um, but it is something that Baptist churches hold in high regard it comes partly out of what we talked about last week our understanding of the priesthood of all believers that we are meant to act as equals within a fellowship of believers and so we bring that into the idea of how do we then organize or structure our church uh, can we put the slides up behind me here I got a new clicker and I'm gonna try my best to use it this is my first time so let's see how this goes all right not well is the answer oh seriously can you click on the slide on the right maybe and it'll maybe give me okay let's see if that gives me I no all right we're just gonna have you advance it because I did it We are super professional. It's one of the things that we value as a church, a high value of professionalism. All right, this thing seriously does not like me. Of course, it worked really well in rehearsal uh, an hour and a half ago. All right, can we just go to the next slide? I'll just get you to do it for me this week, and I will play with that. So I wanted to start with a bit of a definition of what congregationalism is, because it looks different from some other things that seem similar. So congregationalism is not democracy. It's not the same thing. It has some, some great differences to it. it. Congregationalism is based on this idea that we all have access to God, that we should all be coming into his presence, and that he speaks to all of us as individuals. And so here's a definition from the Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec. They say, Baptists believe that government in a local church is controlled by the pr principles of the priesthood of all believers, the lordship of Christ, the authority of the scriptures, and the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Christ present in the lives of congregational members leads them corporately to discover and obey his mind and will. Part of what we need to understand about congregationalism is it's actually a process of discernment. The purpose of it is that we together would struggle to understand what God's will is for us. It's not about us coming together and voting about what's best for me or what's best for them or, or even what I think this should be. It's actually about us trying to discern what God is speaking. And because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, it means that we believe that God speaks to all of us, that he doesn't just speak to an elder to impose the plan or to a bishop or to a pastor to make it so, but that he speaks to all of us and that we're to share that responsibility to seek the will of God and to discover what his will is for us. How many of you are in small groups as part of this season? 
a lot of you. So one of the last questions that you're asked in your small group is for this distinctive to kind of give a rating for how Baptist you are in this way. So do you fully adhere to this idea or only partially? And I ask you to kind of put it on a one to 10. Now I want to start by admitting that I'm probably like a seven and a half or an eight on this one. On the others, I'm probably more a nine and a half or a 10. This one I struggle with a little bit for a couple reasons. One, it's tough to find verses that just state this. You know, there's no verse that just states, for all time being, the churches shall be congregational. There's not a verse that does that. And so we piece it together from some different scriptures, and I'll try to do that with you today. But I would say as well that there are some other scriptures that we have to, in some sense, talk around or explain. And whenever I find myself doing that, I realize I'm probably on a little looser ground than for those topics where there's really black and white scriptures, where it's, it's really obvious this is what the Lord's telling us to do. This is one where I feel a little bit less. And so part of my talking about this today is going to be sharing a whole bunch of stories about different times I've been involved in congregationalism where it's worked well and where it's worked poorly and what's brought that about. So one of the very first congregational meetings I went to, I was, uh, I was 19 and I'd just become a member of a church and I went to this meeting and the first thing that kind of struck me was the bizarreness of the reality that we all got one vote. Because the church I was going to was right near the seminary for that denomination. And so in our midst, there were professors, there were retired pastors, there were extremely godly men and women who had done a lifetime of ministry. And it seemed really odd to me at 19 that I got one vote and they got one vote. Part of me felt like maybe we should decide who gets 10 votes and who gets one to balance that a little bit. But it seemed really odd that my that my understanding of what God was saying carried as much weight as that 85-year-old retired minister. Um, and so I started with kind of this, this struggle with how this works. The second thing that I realized was in the decisions we made, there wasn't always consensus. So if our purpose of meeting as a congregation is to determine God's will, one would think that we would come to consensus at the end because we serve one God who is sovereign and has, I think, one idea for what is his will for us. But often at the end of a congregational meeting, the votes are 80% or 90%, but rarely are they 100%. And I think it's okay for us to talk about these things and to struggle with these things. It's a system we use, but it's not a perfect system. And so there wasn't always consensus. At the second meeting I went to, there was a, a fascinating agenda item where in one of the renovations that we were doing, they had to replace an electrical panel in order to complete the renovation, the main panel for the church. And it was a costly item, so they brought it to the congregation to make that decision. The decision seemed really obvious to most of us in the room. The panel didn't meet code anymore, and it needed to be replaced in order to do the work that had already been approved. Seems like a pretty obvious, let's do this kind of vote, right? They discussed it for 45 minutes. They talked about it, they argued about it, they debated it, and I didn't know what was going on, I didn't know why. And so after I, I talked to one of the pastors, I said, why was that such a contentious vote? And he said this, he said, the decision in itself wasn't contentious. The reason it took as long as it did is because there are people who were here when they built the building and they remember who voted for the cheaper electrical contract 20 years ago. And this was their way of sticking it in their face, making them talk about this for 45 minutes, this decision that we all knew needed to happen. Which leads me to one of the first premises of congregationalism that isn't always met. It requires mature believers. It does. It doesn't work if we're petty and bickering, if we're not forgiving one another, if we're not in relationship and community with one another, if we're not, if we're not in God's word together, if we're not hearing from God at all, how can we vote what we think God's will is for our group? And so it requires a mature believer, and that isn't always present in churches, sometimes understandably. Sometimes there's churches that welcome a whole bunch of new believers right away. And it's hard to then assume that they have a level of maturity to make some of those decisions. These people have been in the church for a long time and in my estimation lacked the maturity to be part of a congregational church. All right, 
So to understand the Baptist model, I think it's helpful to look at some of the other models because you'll see these, I think, somewhat in scripture at times. And I would also say that we'll see them in a lot of the churches we interact with. So let's look at the, the next slide. The first government model that we'll look at is called Episcopal. And this is the idea, it's, called, it's also called the hierarchy model, hierarchical model. Uh, it takes its name from the Greek episkopos, which is translated as overseer or bishop in your scriptures. Um, under this view, the bishops have a diocese in which they make decisions about who will be leaders in the church. Under this view, the Pope in Roman Catholicism or the Metropolitan in the Orthodox Church or Archbishop in some other churches, they rule over the bishops of the various dioceses. Thus, an extra local authority leads individual churches. So there's something outside of the local congregation that has authority. Remember first that any issue of church governments involves the question of where the authority in the church lies. And this is a top-down or hierarchical model. Individual churches must receive permission and authority from denominational higher-ups for such things as hiring clergy or doctrinal changes, and decisions about doctrine and practice would be made by those in authority. So this is the model that is practiced by Roman Catholics, by some Anglicans, um, and by Eastern Orthodox churches for the most part. Now this is probably one of, the one, one of the models that Baptists push back the most strongly against. And it's because of our deep understanding of the priesthood of all believers, and partly because of some of that 15th, 16th century history that we share with those groups. Uh, so E.A. Lytton writes, no order of bishops appears in the New Testament. The church historically used this model in the centuries immediately after the apostolic era, and it's based on the idea of apostles authority being passed down through the lines whereby the apostles had authority or to order local churches and tell them what to do um, baptists hold that there is no such thing as a bishop who rules over the elders of the churches in the new testament instead we see elders and bishops as synonyms for instance luke writes that paul Paul called together the elders of the church. That's in Acts 20. But later, Paul says that God had made these same people overseers to the church or bishops to the church. So we see those two words as being used interchangeably. Likewise, Paul wanted elders in every city in Titus 1.5 and then writes that the overseer must be above reproach two verses later in Titus 1.7. It appears that these terms are used interchangeably, that it's not setting up a hierarchy. And I would suggest that that's some of how we're wired to read scripture as Western Christians is to see hierarchy in places that there isn't necessarily hierarchy. And of course, our biggest problem with this is that it creates a top-down structure that violates the idea that we all can hear from God. All right, next model, the Presbyterian model or Presbyterian model. This comes from the Greek presbyteros, uh, which means elder or is translated as elder. In this view, the members of the church elect elders to a session or to a board of elders. Grudem writes, the pastor of the church will be one of the elders in the session, equal in authority to the other elders. The elders of the session run their local church, and some are also members of the presbytery, which governs over the larger church. So the presbytery is a group of governing elders who make decisions for all the churches in the denomination. And this model falls somewhat between the other two. So it sits between congregationalism and Episcopal. Here there is not a bishop, but a group called the Presbytery that is made up of both clergy and lay people. Each area would have a Presbytery, and when decisions need to be made, a local church decides on issues together, but must get approval or permission from a Presbytery to act. In this way, authority lies with the Presbytery. Lay people do have some say in this model as they make up an equal number of the presbytery as the clergy, but the decisions are decided outside of the local congregation often. So this is uh, an idea that's used by Presbyterian churches, of course, by Reformed churches, which we have lots of in our area, and in some ways by some Lutheran groups would use this kind of model. And so again, there's a little bit of a top-down, bottom-up kind of approach that has some aspects of both within it. And again, there's nothing inherently wrong with this idea. They certainly have scriptural uh, texts that they would point to, many of them similar to the ones we would use for congregationalism. They just understand them slightly differently. Um, and again, the, the risk of this is that, uh, that there is some top-down understanding to this, but without a pope. It's a group kind of top-down. All right, congregational governments. 
So this is what uh, Baptist churches would practice. Uh, and under this view, each individual church has its own government without an extra church government to control it. So there's not something outside of the congregation that instructs us or tells us what to do, which both has blessings and struggles to it, of course. The congregation rules the church by vote. Erickson writes, every member of the local congregation has a voice in its affairs. It is the individual members of the congregation who possess and exercise authority. They set up committees to prepare material for votes, like a budget or, or a, a doctrinal statement. However, these committees can be overruled by the congregation. So Erickson writes, committees are not to exercise their authority independently of or contrary to the wishes of the people. They vote at an annual meeting for committee leaders, major changes, and the budget. The congregation can delegate decision-making power to a pastor or to staff on some issues, but the congregation is meant to have final authority. Churches can voluntarily join with other like-minded groups. However, the only authority these larger associations would have over the local congregation would be the authority to exclude an individual church from the association, but not the authority to govern its individual affairs. And talk a little bit more about congregationalism because this is kind of the one that we practice. So the idea is that the, the authority lies simply with the local church where every member is meant to have an equal voice. And within this model, people in a local church would have different roles. Ministers are hired and ordained by a congregation, not sent by a higher denominational body, but brought out of the group of congregation to serve them. That's what my role is meant to look like. I'm meant to be one of you that serves you. The congregation will then vote for or against their ideas with everyone, including the minister, having one vote. Within this view also lies the idea that local churches do not have a denominational authority over them. Some call this local church autonomy. This means that the denominational body is not above a local church. Instead, Baptist churches will often form into what are called associations. These are groups of Baptist churches that have common confessions of faith and have chosen to join together for support, unity, and mission. Within an association, there may be a statement of faith. However, no church can be forced to comply with a particular issue. Instead, a church with vast disagreements with the association should choose not to associate anymore. Associations are always voluntary on the part of the church in this model. And in that last part is some of the ways that we have found problems as Baptists. In that the idea is that if you don't agree with the ideas of the group, of the association, that you would, of integrity, step out of that group. You would acknowledge that you don't agree anymore with their statements of faith and agreements and remove yourself from it. And as we know, that does not always happen. Sometimes those churches continue to associate. And so most Baptist churches, the Southern Baptists did this, I think about 20 years ago, our denomination has done this in the last couple of years, have been, been out of necessity forced to make models that allow to remove churches that aren't in sync with what we believe to be true. We used to think people would do that on their own. And I think there was a time where that was true. It's not so true anymore. And so there has developed mechanisms within most denominations to remove churches that aren't following the statement of faith that we hold to be true. And there's processes with all kinds of steps uh, for reconciliation as part of that in most of the groups. How many of you know what denomination this church is a part of? Hey, there's a few of you. That's, that's not too bad. Uh, we are part of the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada. I call it the redundant denomination. Um, the reason is that there are three groups in, in Canada that share that kind of titling. And so we're part of the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada. There's Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec. And there's Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada. And for us in particular, it seems like we needed Canadian in twice, as if that was the most important part of who we are, which it is not. Um, but we do... Uh, the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada run from Manitoba to BC um, and are an affiliation of churches, an association of churches that freely associate with one another for the purpose of mission. And I'll say this, we are classic Baptists, so the denomination doesn't have a lot of influence or, or 
or presence really in our congregations. We are fairly independent. Um, they don't dictate to us our theology. Uh, we freely associate with them. And if we feel they're going in a direction that doesn't reflect God's word and who, who he is in our understanding, we will leave um, because that's how Baptist churches are meant to operate. And so we are part of the Canadian Baptists of Western, Congre of Western Canada. Man, I feel like in a lecture like this, I should be stopping for questions every once in a while. It just feels much more like a lecture today. We are getting to some, 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 uh, some scriptures in a minute here, which, uh, which we will talk through, but it feels a little more like I'm a professor than a, um, than a pastor today. So I want to reiterate why I think this is important. This is the structure by which we operate. And so if you want to make changes, if you want things to shift in one direction or another in this church, there are ways to go about doing that that honors the system that's in place. It also dictates why we do things the way we do. And so if you had a senior pastor that wanted to start baptizing infants, I'm trying to use something non-controversial that's easy for us to kind of give some examples, um, I would not be able to make that decision on my own. I wouldn't be able to just start doing that. I would probably get fired if I started doing that. Um, there are multiple groups by design in the system that can remove me from my office, um, including and foremost the congregation. You guys get to decide whether I continue in this position or not. Similarly, the elders of this church would not get to make that decision on their own to change the theology or polity or practice of our church. It's actually something that only the congregation can change. And that has some blessing to it and some difficulty to it. And I'll, I'll spell those out a little bit more. But that's part of the reason we're talking about this is we want to understand a little bit about how things work in this group. So last week when we talked about the, uh, the priesthood of all believers, part of the understanding of that was to acknowledge that you are expected to have ministry that you are performing in your life. That you are expected to be in communication with God. Part of today is to say when you're part of a congregation, you are expected to be reading God's word. To be talking to him about the things that we are discussing in this church as a group. And to be determining what you believe God's will is for this place, for this season. I don't get to set the vision for us on all things. I get to set the vision on some things, but not on everything. That comes somewhat from the congregation at times. I want to read a, a quote from someone who's, who's probably a little more of a Congregationalist, a better Baptist than I am even. Uh, his name is Larry, Larry Oates, and he laments some of how congregations operate or run these days. And so I want to talk about some of the things he identifies as risks. He says, there is sadly an erosion of congregational rule among Baptists today. Some purposed and some accidental. Purposeful erosion occurs when elder rule replaces congregational government. It also occurs when deacons or committees make decisions that should be reserved for the congregation alone. Purposed erosion occurs as well when pastors begin to assume a CEO-style authority beyond their biblical mandate. Informal erosion occurs when only a small minority of members participate in business meetings, creating a de facto oligarchy. It may also come as a result of a church growing through the assimilation of members from hierarchical churches who transfer their old polity to their new church and assume that church must be in complete agreement with some form of denominational oversight. Now, I would acknowledge that all of these are risks to congregationalism. There are lots of Baptist churches that have a pastor that acts as a CEO, that oversteps their authority and doesn't lean on the congregation for making some of those decisions, often out of a mistrust of the congregation, sometimes out of some pride, sometimes out of a, an understanding that they're more spiritual than the congregation. So there's often a pride behind those kinds of leaders within the church. Similarly, we often see, uh, see governments in Baptist church that look a lot more like elder-led or elder-directed governments. And I would say, in this model, this line is kind of the most hazy. Um, it looks really different for other churches. And how it works, how those groups interact with one another, um, looks very different depending even what Baptist church you're in in our denomination. Um, so on here, it kind of has arrows only going in one direction. And that's not so much how we operate here. Um, I've said, yeah, 
Oh, so I should point over here too. Th thank you. This middle line here is what we're talking about. Uh, so the, the congregation, kind of the top-down idea or, or bottom-up idea feels, feels like it's well-described, but this middle line doesn't maybe reflect how every Baptist church operates. I've told you that, that the congregation has some authority over me and can, uh, can reprimand me, can rebuke me, can, can speak things to me. In our context, so can the church office and so can the church council and so can the officers. So so church council would be something like our ministry management board. Uh, officers would be something like elders or deacons. And so both of those groups actually have authority over me too. And I sit on the elders. And so there's all kinds of lines this way and this way, back and forth. And I am part of the congregation, so to me there should be a little arrow up that way too. Um, because we actually all interact with each other. And the balance of how those groups interact with each other is different in different Baptist churches. And this is where I'm probably not a very good congregationalist because I see a role for both some elder-led or driven ideas, um, for some pastor-led ideas, and for some congregational-led ideas. That for me, there, there should be a balance between these three groups in some sense. Um, so again, I'm probably not the best Baptist in the room. Uh, I want to talk about some texts. So uh, I'm not putting texts up on the screen partly because I hope you bring your Bibles with you. So if you're not doing that, start bringing one. You won't stand out when you do that. If not, you probably have your cell phone on you. Uh, you can pull it up. We'll all assume you're looking at scripture, but, and hopefully you are. Um, but we'd love for you to get into the text. And there's a few reasons for that. And part of that is what we're talking about. The priesthood of all believers idea. I believe that God speaks to you through scripture. I believe that he might draw you to the text that comes before this or the one that comes after it. I know that's happened for me a lot of times when I'm listening to a sermon and the guy gets a little long-winded and keeps talking. Sometimes I have my own little study with God on what's in front of me. And I think that's actually a good and healthy thing. And so I want you to have a Bible. I want you to open it up. I want you to look at it. We usually have Bibles sitting at the back and I offer them to you to use for the service. They've been disappeared right now. We'll get them back in here. But you're always welcome to borrow a Bible or to take one home with you. Uh, they're freely given, so you can't steal them. They're yours to take. Um, but they're not there today. Anyway, I'm not going to put them up on the screen because I want you to look at them. That's the, that's the moral of that story. So let's look at Acts chapter 15, verse 22. Uh, so the book of Acts is about the New Testament church. It describes uh, the different acts of the church uh, in its first years of existence. And it frequently kind of talks about some shifts or changes in leadership and how they did that and in how they went about that and it looks different in some different texts and so acts chapter 15 verse 22 it says then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to antioch with paul and barnabas they chose judas called barsabas and silas men who were leaders among the believers now what those in support of congregationalism want you to see in this text is that it was the apostles and elders along with the whole church that made this decision. That it wasn't that the apostles made it on their own or the elders decided it on their own, but it was the whole church for this very important choosing of people that they would send out on their behalf. And they did that together. We see multiple texts where we see that happening, where the church together seems to make decisions. Uh, our main text for today, or the one that's at least the largest one that we'll spend a little bit of time talking about, is in Acts chapter 6. So if you're in 15, switch back a couple pages. Um, and in Acts chapter 6 is one of the first times that they seem to set up what most of us think is a deacon's board, or they seem to set up some sort of, uh, some sort of board with responsibilities apart from the apostles. And this is the first time this happens in Scripture, and I, I think in history. Um, so in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews or the Greek Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews, those that were Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. 
So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So the first thing, again, that the congregationalists would like you to see is that when they gather these together, they gather the whole group. It's not just about the apostles exercising their apostolic authority, but they gather the whole group to make this decision once again. Discipline similarly was the responsibility of the whole group. We see this in Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17, and 1 Corinthians 5. These are, times where the, these are times where they seem to gather the whole group or ask the whole group to act. There certainly are other times where the apostles seem to speak authoritatively. And I think if we're going to look at this honestly, we need to acknowledge that. There are times where Paul seems to instruct the church to say, this is what you need to do. And it sounds like it's he's saying, I've made a decision on behalf of you. But in this text, we see that they gathered the whole group together to make these most important decisions. Now, what was the conflict? The conflict was that there were Greek Jews that were complaining that the Hebrew, Hebrew Jews had control of a ministry in their church. They were distributing food to the widows, to those that were in need. They were giving food. And the Hebrew, Hebraic Jews were favoring other Hebraic Jews. They were making sure they got the best of the food or the most of the food. And the Greek Jews said, this doesn't seem right to us. And so they bring it to the apostles who seem like they were the de facto leaders at the time. The apostles gather everyone together and they say it's not really right for us to focus on these kinds of things because it would take all of our time and we would be neglecting the things that we feel as apostles were called to do. Now some people will start to make a distinction between elders and deacons in this text. That this is one of the first lines where they seem to say when you don't make a line between the spiritual things that are required in a church and the physical things, the spiritual things can be overlooked that seemed that does seem to be apparent in this text whether it's actually speaking forever that we should have an elders and deacon board is is up for some discussion but it does seem to be one of the first times where that concern is brought forward and I would say that concern is real today as well that when we put just groups of people in the room to talk about the things the church needs to do even really good spiritual leaders we tend to worry about the boiler blowing up in the basement more than we do the spiritual needs or praying for the group or preaching God's words. Those things sometimes get sidelined for the urgent. And so this is kind of one of the first times where they say in order to prioritize the spiritual needs of the church, it's best if we bring some other people in to help. Now, one of the things that, and this is just a, I know I don't have time for this, but this is just a side thing, a thing that I find most amazing about this text. And that is the list of the names of people that they choose. The list of the names of the people that they choose are all Greek names. So what happens is the Greeks come and say, we've been treated poorly. We've been mistreated by the Hebrew Jews who aren't serving food to our widows and to those in need in our church. And the church's response is to place in position of authority those that were wronged. It's a fascinating thing. They choose seven Greeks instead of the seven Hebrews that used to be in charge. Just something to think about later. All right, so we see in this text that it's not elders, deacons, but apostles, deacons, but that there's a leadership model adjust to meet the needs of the church, that there's an adjusted to the leadership model. And this is something I think we see in Scripture throughout. There's shifting systems of organization of Israel through the Old Testament. We see first a system where Moses seems to rule, and then some of that authority is passed to judges, and then there's a time of prophets and kings, and changes happen for different reasons, some of them good, some of them sinful, but we see that there was a adjustments to the system. And similarly, the apostles seem to adjust structures as needed. Uh, we see this in Acts chapter 6, that this is one of the first times that they kind of say we had this apostle-led church and now we need some more help in this. So we're going to bring some other people into leadership on board. And I think we see this in Titus chapter 1 verse 5 as well. So uh, in Titus, there's some instructions given to Titus by Paul. And he instructs him to appoint some elders to the churches of the area. I'll read it for you. Uh, 